All right, everyone. Uh, it is 11 o'clock by my watch in Chicago, so it's time to begin. Uh, good morning or good afternoon for wherever you may be. And thank you for attending this event, Virtual I Tape Library, VTL Technology for IBM I by Chuck Lazinski and Eric Dabrowski. Uh, Chuck is with Help Systems and Eric is with Laser Vault. Uh, this PowerCast is sponsored by Help Systems. My name is Ian Carwright, and I'm Education Manager for Common, and I appear on your screen as Ian Carwright. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, go ahead and send me a message through chat. Uh, if you'd like to send a written question to Chuck and Eric during the presentation, also use chat or the Q&A, and they will answer your questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. Uh, presenting today, as I said, are Chuck Lazinski and Eric Dabrowski. Uh, Chuck has over 30 years of experience in IT, including 25 plus years on the IBM I platform. His background covers a wide variety of technical responsibilities involving system implementation, programming, operations, and support. He's a certified IBM systems admin and is a help systems robot certified specialist. Um, also presenting today is Eric Dabrowski. Eric is a Microsoft certified software engineer who has worked for Electronic Storage Corporation and Laser Vault since 1993. His areas of expertise include fiber channel and SCSI protocol, device driver development, and IBM tape storage solutions. With that, I am going to ask Chuck to go ahead and present. Chuck, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Ian. Really appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Common for being the uh, mothership of all IBM I user groups out there. I do want to make a quick plug for our, our uh, local user group called QUser. You know, a lot of user groups have gone pretty much completely online uh, like us. So if you're looking for a, a community of like-minded IBM I individuals out there and looking for some education and, and uh, uh, training on some of the new technologies, certainly reach out to QUser or your local user group. Um, you know, we've got a session coming up here with Barbara Morris that's going to be uh, you know, really excellent. All right, I'd like to set the stage a little bit. We've been using virtual tape library technology in our lab here at Help Systems for over 15 years with Robot Save, and, and now too with BRMS as Help Systems also develops that technology. Today, you'll learn how easy it is to integrate a VTL appliance with IBM I to accomplish that hands-off and automated save process, and in fact, make your save strategy more robust. You know, heck, other platforms have been using virtual tape library technology for even longer. And, you know, when you think about it, we all live and work in a highly virtualized environment. So it should be uh, second nature. Uh, many companies haven't used physical tape for years. And, you know, and speaking with Larry uh, Bull, who's former president of Common, he may very well be listening today. One of his 2021 predictions was that this would be the year of VTL. So having a hands-off backup strategy has proven to be even more important in the past year, of course. And we'll show you some of the numbers on that from the uh, Help Systems Marketplace survey. Help Systems partners with uh, many of the VTL um, uh, vendors in our market space. Laser Vault is part of Electronic Storage Corporation, and they've been working on IBM mid-range AS400 IBM I for many years. They've been really great to work with. So today we thought we'd partner up and talk about how to go about automating your backups from both a hardware and a software perspective and show you how they come together and how your IBM I sees the tape library technology with some live demo. So. Hopefully all the uh, all of our connections will remain up and so forth at our various locations and we'll be able to do that. So Ian, I'd like you to launch the first polling question. The question is what backup technology are you using now? Uh, so feel free to uh, select those that apply. Um, uh, Eric, what sort of trends are you seeing? Oh, Eric, you might unmute. Yeah, Erica, uh, you have audio, you have microphone issues now. <clears throat> so do the same process that I asked you for the audio in, and uh, we'll try you again in a bit. Okay. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, feel free to answer the polling question. Um, so, you know, the, over the past few years, especially, we've been seeing more and more of a migration to a hands-off approach, and uh, though physical tape certainly does test, apply, test. and we're going to switch. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. 
it. Here's the results. Uh, so uh, looks like tape library with multiple tape drives uh, rules. So that would be physical media. Uh, on the low end, we've got single tape drive with one physical cartridge, uh, tape library with one tape drive, uh, a little bit of cloud backup going on. And look at that, uh, Eric, 38%. Uh, already using VTL, we see that number slowly climbing, slowly climbing. So we want to talk a little bit about the numbers and certainly, uh, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing. All right. So first of all, we thought we'd start with a little discussion about, you know, our, uh, the last 12 months or so, what have we been seeing in relation to um, uh, COVID-19? And what we're going to look at is some data that we collected toward the end of 2020 in our uh, IBMI marketplace survey. It's something that Help Systems has been doing for five years now. It's available on our website. It's open source, so to speak. Feel free to use any of the data uh, that is included in it. And it's interesting reading. So one of the questions that we had from the survey was, what are your top five concerns um, uh, around your IT environment. And this was just sort of in general, not necessarily focused on uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, very much on the top end was uh, security, but look at number two, high availability and disaster recovery. So that came in as a strong uh, number two, as far as uh, concern. I thought it was kind of interesting too, when you look at 2020 versus uh, the, the data that was collected at the end of 2019 presented in 2020, and then the data that was collected at the end of 2020 presented in 21. Um, uh, some of the high-end numbers like security, high availability, modernizing came down ever so slightly. IBMI skills, data growth, reduced IT spending has come up a little bit. So certainly we do have uh, some challenges. Okay. Now, COVID-19 specific uh, question, where do you feel your IT team has struggled with the most? All right, and if you look at the, uh, the bottom of the list, of course, remote access to IT functions, and that, that's the length and breadth of you know, how we operate remotely, just like we're doing today. So that was, a, you know, that was a struggle for a lot of companies. As you can see, almost half of the respondents said that they had uh, you know, struggles with that. And then if you look right about in the middle, uh, it says 21%. So better than 20% struggled with high availability and disaster planning during the pandemic. And mostly related to the fact that guess what? We're not in the office. We're not in the data center. We have to learn how to do those things in some sort of remote fashion. Okay, uh, another operational question that came out of our uh, marketplace survey, which technologies have you used on IBMI to adapt to this new work from home environment? All right, so obviously VPN rules, uh, you see ACS at the top, uh, which everybody should be using ACS by now, but right in the middle there, 18 and 14 percent, more automation of processes that were done manually. We're definitely seeing that trend here at Help Systems because we have so many different uh, automation tools for both IBMI as well as out there in the Windows uh, world, Windows and Linux world. And then automated backups without tapes came in at 14%. So that's something that's being looked at real serious by uh, the folks in the IBMI world. Okay, so let's look at some additional trends that feed into this uh, VTL uh, trend. All right, so first of all, let's look at the question, how do you recover? Believe it or not, we asked the question, how do you recover in our marketplace survey? And you know, keep in mind that this question was a multiple choice question. And uh, so it says 60% recover from high availability and Eric and I kind of chuckle at that. Uh, because, you know, if you, if you corrupt something on your production system and replicate it to your target system, guess what? You're not going to be recovering from that target system. But combined with point-in-time backups, all right, now you've got the ability to do some recovery. And you can see 54% say recover from tape, 25% say uh, virtual tape library, 10% from cloud backups. And that pretty well jives with the, the live survey that we just got got done with. 
All right. Um, and then in the lower right hand corner, what type high availability technology do you use with IBM I? Um, the majority use some kind of software based uh, remote journaling technology, 22% uh, hardware uh, replication. So that's becoming more and more common, SAN based, PowerHA. Uh, et cetera, as far as more sector-based replication and uh, still 29% say no HA in place. Okay, so that's just a little bit about HA and DR. How about the cloud, IBM I in the cloud? One of the questions we had was, uh, where do you run your IBM I workloads? And 84% said on-prem only. So on-prem still, absolutely rules cloud is catching on more and more and you know when we talk about cloud basically we're talking about okay your server is off there being managed uh, by um, uh, another entity all right it's just not on-prem it's out there and you connect it via uh, the internet uh, or some communication methodology so 16 percent say that there is some cloud component all right, 16% say some cloud component. And of that, 10% of that um, uh, is a, a hybrid environment. And then a smaller chunk is, um, is cloud only, all right? And of this entire amount, 16% of our market, what's being done out there? Core business applications, DR, test and development and backups. All right, so that might mean, for instance, running your backup locally and sending it off to the cloud, off to an MSP that's maybe hosting um, a, a warm or a cold partition for you to restore your data to. All right, so that's, those are some of the numbers that we wanted to just sort of level set. This is what we're seeing. Feel free to go out to the Help Systems website and search for the Marketplace survey. You will see that out there. All right, and with that, I'd like to bring in uh, Eric, and we want to talk about uh, more specifically what are some of the risks and advantages and costs associated with going with a virtual tape library. And keep in mind that you know everything we're talking about here is uh, could be applied to any of the virtual tape uh, library technology that's out there. All right, Eric, are you with me? So Chuck, just want to verify, can you hear me since I had audio issues earlier? You sound good, yeah. All right, yay. <laughs> yeah, technology. Okay, so yeah, let's let's talk about some of the risks of using physical tape media. And, um, you know, some of them are very obvious, things like tape breakage, which hopefully is pretty rare, but I'm sure it does happen. Um, Probably more common though, are things like mislabeled, lost, hopefully not stolen too often, but and potentially destroyed tapes. Um, so those are just risks that we've heard of and things to keep in mind. Um, I would say a lost or mislabeled or misplaced tape is probably your biggest risk, just especially in cases where you're having to physically transport from your primary location to your DR. So if yeah. your media yeah, is, Eric, I was, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just thinking like a, a, the external and internal uh, tape label also could be, uh, you know, could complicate your life. Yeah, you know, a lot of times you're buying tape cartridges with a serial number printed on the side of them. And so it's not real intuitive as to what's what when you're looking at just a box full of physical tapes. Um, if your media is off site, then you're potentially having to deal with delays in retrieval. So you're wanting to restore a particular object or library database and, huh, where is it? Well, it's on a tape. Well, where's that tape? Oh, it's over in the warehouse. Okay. Well, let's go send somebody over there to get it. Oops. They're stuck in traffic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, people are waiting on you, you know, so that's a risk of physical tape. Um, of course, there's human error, that's inevitable. So you have things such as somebody forgot to put the tape in the drive, you know, smaller shops that are using singular tape drives, that's a manual process many times where you're 
taking a physical tape off the shelf, putting it in the drive before you go home for the evening, your backup's gonna run at night. And if somebody did a display tape on that with an asterisk unload, oops, backup didn't run, the tape was ejected, you know. The other potential um, human errors are, you grab the tape, you put it in there, you didn't happen to notice that the right protect tab is set. So backup got stuck waiting on a message, you know. <laughs> It's human error, it happens. So all of those things can add up to holes or gaps in tape backups, it's that manual process. So if you're looking for a backup for a, a object on a certain day, and we just happened to have a problem that day and didn't get a backup done that day, then you may not be able to find what you're looking for. And so any of those possibilities are multiplied by the more number of tapes you have. Yeah, Eric, too, I was thinking about uh, with the uh, uh, physical tape, you've got uh, cleaning requirements on your tape drive. Yes, yes, you have cleaning requirements on the tape drive. Um, you know, and just from a mechanical perspective, you have certain numbers of hours, certain numbers of usage on a tape. Right, exactly. Yep. So with physical media issues, there's certain things that come up that are maybe a little more intangible. And that's things like business continuity costs due to loss of data, uh, facility costs, storing to save, uh, the cost to save and the cost to uh, have a data center, labor costs for people to manage and run that. And then what are your costs if you've lost customers due to a data loss? You also have to consider costs of purchasing new or replacement tape drives. Like I said, those have you know, a certain number of hours that they're good for. Um, you have to consider costs of downtime. If you have a, uh, employees waiting on recovery of some data, or if people are unable to access the system while it's being backed up, um, your off-site storage costs, warehousing, transportation or shipping of tapes. Um, things you might not immediately think of, but how many customers are inconvenienced or how many customers are lost potentially due to a system being down or due to lost data. Um, you do have the issue with tape media degrading over time. It's pretty resilient, but there are a limited number of uses if you're cycling through tapes in a pool, eventually you're gonna to have to look at replacing them. They have a certain shelf life. And then, you know, most intangible probably is what is the cost of your business to your business reputation if you're having to tell your customers, sorry, we had an incident and lost your data. So, you know, those are issues that customers have talked to us about and things that we've seen. And so other things to keep track of, again, like you said, cleaning, that's part of the labor cost. Um, multiple copies, right? If you wanna make more than one copy of your backup, which is highly recommended, then you have physical tape drives required to make that copy. So there's some additional costs there. And uh, again, tape media failure, it, it does happen. And so that's an issue to be aware of with physical media. Yeah, and I wonder how many how many folks really pay attention to the number of times that a particular tape has been used, a particular cartridge. You know, I doubt that that I doubt that that happens. I know our Robot Save product keeps track of that, but still, how many people really pay attention to that? I would say probably very few. Right. You know, unless you're getting totally some agree. sort of an alert that's jumping up in your face saying, hey, this tape's been used a hundred times, maybe we ought to swap it out. Then, yeah, most likely very few people are, are keeping track of that. That would be my guess. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the advantages of using virtual tape libraries. The main keyword that I would touch on is flexibility, right? That's the primary advantage in virtual tape. 
it adds flexibility. So for starters, we can simplify operations. Um, we're not having to physically load and, un and unload tape cartridges. We're not having to deal with magazines, pulling them out of the tape library, inventorying the tapes, putting them on a shelf somewhere or in a vault. So, you know, that adds to the simplification of that. There's less physical intervention. You have flexibility in where you store your data with a virtual tape library. So a lot of VTL appliances will save to internal hard drive. And some of them you're kind of locked into that. Other VTL appliances, you have options. You can save to internal hard drive if you want on the server. You can save to network attached storage or a storage area network, NAS and SAN. You can save to various dedupe appliances. If you've already got a dedupe appliance in house that you're using for other backup purposes, then a lot of times it's not much of a stretch to carve out some additional space on that and then allow the uh, virtual tape library application to save the tape data to that dedupe appliance. And so some of those that we list here, Exagrid, Cohesity, Rubric, those are the primary ones I'm aware of. NetApp is probably another one that I've seen at a lot of places. So again, just more flexibility. You can save that data to different storage appliances and um, you know, replicate it in many cases. Another option that you're granted with virtual tape library is backup to the cloud gives you another layer of data protection. And we are starting to see more people do that, especially as people's network internet speeds come up. It's becoming more practical to um, save that data up to a, a cloud storage location. More commonly, I would say that we see people maintain a second virtual tape library at another location and then they'll have a wide area network connection and replicate their data from source to target there. And the DR side usually is another physical location. Some cases it can be at an MSP, a managed service provider. So their data will be backed up locally and then replicated to an MSP where they'll, they'll have LPARs on standby. Um, another advantage to VTL is the ease of integration with robot save or BRMS or existing backup software or CL scripts. So if a VTL is done right, it's emulating physical tape library, physical tape drive, and it really should be transparent to the IBMI, right? The IBMI is just going to see another tape device. So what you're going to do is plug in your VTL, it's going to auto config, come up, you're going to see tape MLB 02, tape 02, and you're probably just going to modify potentially your device description names, put the VTL in place of the physical. You may have to add some media if you, you know, have certain media definitions. And then from there, your backup software should be able to use it. Um, another nice advantage of VTL is it's going to keep all those tape volumes available in the library. So you're not having to deal with taking physical tapes in and out of the library, moving them around. They're there online available for, re for use for save and restore purposes. And then that helps with the high speed backup and recovery of the data, not having to wait on it. And then there's no real limit to virtual tape in terms of sizes or number of slots. There, there are practical limits eventually you start hitting extremely huge numbers. But you know some of the smaller tape libraries, they may have 48 slots for tape cartridges before you're looking at having to start moving things in and out. 
And when dealing with VTL, a tape volume or a tape cartridge is really just files on disk. So you're really limited only by available disk space on your storage appliance or your VTL appliance. Um, touching again on flexibility, when it comes to expansion in VTL, you're really just changing configuration if you need more slots or if you need more tape drives. Maybe you're adding a fiber channel HBA into the server if you need more you know, physical connectivity. But with a physical tape library, if you need more tape cartridge slots, you're looking at either buying a new larger tape library or adding expansion frames on if you've got one that can do that. And so there's you know, fairly significant cost involved with expanding that. All right, Eric, let's talk about connectivity and configuration, and then we'll go into a little bit of a, a little bit of a live demo. Okay. So yeah, the um, classic connectivity is what we call direct connect. And that just means you're connecting directly from the fiber channel or SAS HBA, host bus adapter on the IBM LPAR, and you're directly plugging it into a VTL device. And there'll be a fiber channel HBA or a SAS HBA in the uh, virtual tape library device. So that's direct connect, that's one option. Um, with SAS, that's pretty much the only option that's direct connect. Next up is you add a fiber channel switch into this uh, equation. And what you're doing there is you're plugging fiber channel cables from your LPAR into the fiber channel switch. And then you're plugging your VTL into the fiber channel switch and what that allows you to do is do some zoning on the switch. Zoning allows you to control which IBM LPAR can see which tape or library device. So you can have some separation there if you need. It also allows you to do device sharing. So if you have one tape library, and let's say you have four physical tape drives in that, then you can share that. And the same can be said about virtual tape. You have one virtual tape library and you have four virtual tape devices in that library, plug them into your fiber channel switch, plug the LPAR in and get the appropriate zoning. And there you go. You've got a device that can be shared from multiple LPARs. Um, another thing that's nice with fiber channel is what's called NPIV. And that stands for Nport ID Virtualization. And in simple terms, basically what that means is just taking a physical fiber channel port, single physical fiber channel port and making it look like multiple fiber channel ports. And so by doing that, it allows you to present multiple drives and libraries over a single uh, fiber channel cable connection. So this can help reducing in the uh, number of ports that you need to use on your fiber channel switch And then as far as speeds are concerned, with virtual tape library, you can do eight, 16 or 32 gigabit connectivity through fiber channel. And that compares with physical tape at the moment, most of the physical tape I've seen has eight gigabit ports in them, physical ports. So with VTL, you actually can jump the connectivity speed up a little bit higher. And we've seen a lot of people using 16 gigabit lately and a few starting to move into 32 gigabit on their connectivity speeds. Okay, so let's look at the replication options here. So things get a little bit more complex with replication. Once you've got a backup, the next question you ask is, how do I get this off site? With um, replication, again, you do have a lot of flexibility with virtual tape library. What you can do is have a primary backup appliance at your primary location, and then another 
DR appliance at your DR location, you save to your primary, and then off hours, once your backup is complete, you're replicating that data from the primary to the DR site. At the DR site, you may have another IBMI system there waiting on standby, and it would be connected to the virtual tape library appliance at the DR site. So it's ready to do restores if needed there, or if you have to do a failover, then you can do backups from your DR site into the DR appliance. Um, one nice thing about VTL is it makes replicating your backups easier. You can do your save, you can have a job start running, automatically replicate the data. You can have an email sent to you once the replication has finished or perhaps an email sent when if there's an error that occurs during replication, network connectivity goes down or something like that. So there's no need to deal with taking tapes in and out through IO ports or ejecting magazines, loading tapes into containers, shipping them off to a storage location. Everything that's happening is kind of touchless. It's an electronic process. Data is being copied across network connections. And um, you know, it's, it's more hands-off, basically. Um, one other option that you do have, and we'll talk more about this here in the upcoming slide, is copies can be made to physical tape if that's needed. So in addition to having digital copies in the VTL appliance and at the DR site, if for some reason you do need a physical copy on tape, you can do that, you have that option. So again, it just flexibility is the keyword here. Okay, so touching on speeds, the speeds in this chart are generally uncompressed throughput. So if you were ha if you had a IFS full of scanned documents, everything's already compressed, you're probably not going to get much more compression on it. These are the speeds you're going to see with the various LTO level tape drives going into that. If you do have compressible data, you're going to get higher speeds. And we found that with VTL, you have quite a bit of flexibility in terms of improving speeds. If you have a VTL device that is saving to internal disk, then you might be limited by spin disk speeds. So if you're willing to do it, you can put SSD in your VTL device and get faster disk write speeds there, which can help with your overall backup speed. There's kind of a, you know, ongoing battle between physical and virtual tape in the speed area. Every couple of years, IBM comes out with another Ultrium 7, 8, 9 tape drive, and they try to bump the speed up every time they do. Um, I'm kind of waiting to see Ultrium 9 here and see what they do on that. But as far as I know, most of the physical tape drives I see are still limited to 8 gigabit connectivity. Um, actual speed, of course, is going to vary based on the complexity of your server and your system. It's factors that are going to be involved are how busy is the IBMI system, how busy is the VTL system, how many things are writing to it at the same time, uh, what kind of traffic are we seeing on your fiber channel SAN switch. So those are just factors that all add into variability in, in speed on that. Okay, so we'll just look quickly at physical media cost comparison here. So LTO8 media is still the winner in terms of dollar per terabyte basis. An LTO8 tape cartridge is gonna cost you roughly 80 bucks. It's gonna hold 12 terabytes native, and that just means if you're getting no compression on it. And that's gonna to come to about roughly $6 a terabyte, a little over $6 a terabyte. IBM takes a fairly, I would say, conservative approach to their compression ratios, and they say 2.5 to 1 is what you can expect. So if, if we take that number, then we're looking at 30 terabytes on an LTOA tape, and so that helps bring our cost down to $2.67 a terabyte. So let's compare that to disk here. Looking at native 
on spin disk with compression, you're looking at anywhere from six to $10 a terabyte. Um, or sorry, yeah, compressed numbers. On native, it's a little higher, obviously, because you're not compressing the data there. But if we get a dedupe appliance involved and we can start getting good deduplication ratios, which 10 to one is a fairly common ratio that I'll see on various dedupe appliances, then you start seeing the costs really come down on the dollar per terabyte number. You see your capacity jumps 10x if with a 10 to one dedupe ratio and you see your dollar per terabyte cost drop. Now, of course, those aren't the only costs involved. You know, you've also got to consider device costs, um, expansion costs, you know, what's it cost to add an additional tape drive? If I need more tape drives versus in a VTL, what's it going to cost me to just add another physical fiber channel port if I need more? Or in some cases, if I'm doing NPIV, it's just a configuration change and I add another virtual port. Uh, another thing to factor into cost is offsite storage and then transportation and retrieval costs for physical tape. Okay, so let's talk about cases where you can kind of get the, the best of both worlds and why VTL can enhance tape usage. So if you can save to a virtual tape library and you don't need to deal with physical tape, why would you? Well, some industries do require physical tape for compliance purposes. They want you to have a physical copy of your data somewhere. So in cases like that, you have the option, you can save to VTL, and then from there you can copy to a physical tape. You also have the ability to use local VTL storage for your high availability so that your most recent data is living on the virtual tape library where it can quickly be restored from. And then you can migrate off your older stuff that you wanna keep for long-term archive onto physical tape. Physical tape does provide what's called an air gap, which is basically a copy of your data that is not electrically connected to anything. So that can help with uh, ransomware concerns. And then finally, I was gonna talk about making duplicate copies of your data. So traditionally we've got dupe tape, which is read data from one tape drive, buffer it up in RAM in the IBMI, write it out to another tape drive, make a copy of it. With VTL, and I don't know if all VTLs do this, I know ours does, you do have an option to do a tape out which is where you have a physical tape drive connected to the VTL appliance. And then from the VTL, you just write the data that was saved from the virtual tape files out to a physical tape. And, and the advantage to that is you're just not tying up IO resources on the IBMI while making that physical copy. Um, yeah, and Eric, I'd, I'd... I'd say that that's one of the things that uh, our listeners should think about uh, in a due diligence, uh, looking at other, you know, looking at your VTL vendors is do they have that option? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that just kind of right. touches on the um, cases where you would use both VTL and physical tape. Yeah, I get the fun part. I get to go into a, a live demo and we're gonna start with the actual uh, VTL user interface. All right, and uh, you know, like I said, we've got a number of VTL appliances in our lab and health systems and um, uh, all the interfaces are, are similar but different, so to speak, all right? So let's jump into the, what's called the Laser Vault Vital uh, user interface and I'm going to drive. Eric's going to do uh, the describing. So here we're on the, the vital status screen. Talk to us a little bit about this. Okay. So this is just kind of a summary of versions of your software, your licensing, you know, how many slots, how many ports you're licensed for, the uh, status, what kind of fiber channel or SAS devices. In this case, we've got four physical devices 
which would be four fiber channel ports. And then where it said, well, the four fiber channel, I guess those would be physical ports. And then when you see below, we have 10 ports, that's virtual ports included in there. And so we're looking at three tape libraries configured, three users and two groups in that. Yeah, and one thing I like, you got your documentation right here. All I have to do is click on that. And uh, voila, that brings up the PDF of the installation user guide. So that's kind of handy. Yeah, it's there for any cases there. So admin screen in ours is at this level is very basic. We're just looking at starting and stopping the service on the server from here. Um, our system configuration screen has our licensing information and then some SMTP settings. And those are used for cases where you replicate and you wanna get a notification when the replication job is done or if an error occurred during replication, and it will send you a, a summary on that. The uh, port information screen, and most VTLs will show you this as well. It's just kind of a summary of all the physical connectivity that you've got going on and, and also virtual connectivity. And so this shows you any port ID that's been assigned if you're, if you're plugged into a fiber channel switch, your uh, connectivity data rate, your connection mode, which in most cases is point to point. Some cases it could be arbitrated loop if you're directly connected to a, a eight gig fiber channel HBA. It's showing you what type of devices you're using. So in this VTL appliance, we've got two ADO fiber channel cards and looks like multiple QLogic 2600 series cards, which are gonna be their 16 gig uh, fiber channel HBA. And then it's, in addition to that, it's just showing you what ports are in use within the configuration, which drive, which library. Yeah, and we'll be focused on this uh, system called Academy and the drive that's uh, configured there. Mm -hmm. We won't bother looking at the users and groups, but there are security options. You can see that I, I logged in uh, with my user name and that gives me uh, a lot of rights on this particular uh, server. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at uh, let's look at Academy and and you want to talk about the storage a little bit? Yeah, so within the um, configuration, we have control over where we want to save data to. And in this case, it looks like we're using some internal disk. We have a path to D colon library two where we're storing some data. Now that path could also be a network path to a um, network storage device. Um, you can save across SMB or NFS to a, a storage device. And then go ahead and click edit there and let's look at the settings that we have set for this library. So we have a library called Academy. We're saving to a path D slash library two. We've given our tape library a serial number. So we, IBM is happy about that. We've selected a tape drive emulation levels. So we're emulating Ultrium 5, LTO 5. We've told it we wanna have 48 storage slots in this library. So that's how many virtual tape cartridges that we can have in here. And then we have some other various settings for read and write caching, data blocking, and then compression and encryption. Um, in the tape drive section, this is where we actually define which fiber channel port or which SAS port we're gonna to use to present a tape drive. And so Chuck has clicked the add button here and this is what it would be like if you were adding another tape drive into this library, you would go in and select a port, give the tape drive a serial number, and then you have the option to turn on control path, which just basically means present the media library along with the tape drive on that connection. So moving into the uh, meet, manage media screen, here's where we see all our virtual tape cartridges that we've created. And notice this under the serial column that you guys have it prefixed with ACAD Academy. So mm -hmm. it kind of gives you some nice flexibility in naming conventions. I've seen customers do this to help reduce confusion when you've got a ton of tapes out there. And let's say you have a production LPAR, a 
development LPAR and a test LPAR. Sometimes I'll see people prefix their tape cartridges with a P for production, D for development, T for test. And that way, when someone's in there just looking at all those tapes, it's very intuitive what's what. So yeah, here's your screen for creating media. You can initialize the tape right here from the library without having to do it from the IBMI side. Create multiple tape images. Tell it the starting number. I want to start at TAP 044. I want to create 20. And it will create multiple tape volumes for you. On this screen, you also uh, see uh, physical and logical size. That's showing you compression versus logical. Uh, it's showing you the element that it's in, which slot the uh, virtual tape is in. Yeah, so pretty good compression here. This was actually the volume we used uh, uh, yesterday, all right, on the 13th. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also showing when the expiration is. And then we can also see the tape labels. Yep. Yeah, you can see the size of each item that was saved on there, the date, expiration of each. Awesome. Awesome. So that was a you know a quick uh, exploration of the um, the VTL side. Let's take a let's take a quick look at the IBM I side. Uh, let's look at the work MLB status. And uh, here's the uh, TAP MLB zero two as um, Eric mentioned. And uh, you know we can look at for instance the tape volumes here. So option nine. We'll see those exact same tape volumes, the ACAD tape volumes, all right, that are in the tape library. And then in terms of the, the product that you're using for um, uh, automating the backups, in this case, we're using Robot Save, and I've just identified TAP MLB02 to Robot Save. And uh, likewise, the uh, single tape device in this case, you might have multiple. So all we have to do is define TAP01 to our uh, backup configuration and we are off and running. So, so let's talk about uh, automating your, your backups. Can I run an, an unattended backup? Of course, we know the answer to that is yes, but let's, let's dig into the details just a little bit. So one of the questions in our marketplace survey was, does your IBMI even run fully attended? And, and, uh, just under half of the respondents said, no, there's a lot of manual intervention that goes on with our IDMI environment. And, you know, and I'd venture to guess that backups are a good part of that. So with COVID-19, of course, we had few people in the office, the access to the data center was very limited. Um, uh, pickup and delivery of tape cartridges, guess what, got a lot more complicated. And ultimately, you know, the business is concerned, are we, are we covered or are there vulnerabilities in our backup and restore process? So some of the roadblocks that uh, we talked to folks about regarding unattended backups are things like restricted state saves. We still hear today people maintaining a spreadsheet of tape volume usage, offsite storage and so forth. Um, you know, I think we can make these things a little bit uh, less painful. So as far as restricted state saves, a couple things to think about. Uh, for instance, the security data does not have to be saved during a restricted state. There's a save sec data command. Uh, likewise with your configuration. Um, how often should you run a restricted state save? Well, uh, we have customers telling us that they run it once a quarter, maybe twice a year after they apply PTFs, all right? And likewise, if you do want to run a restricted state save, how do you automate that? Well, our product has a restricted state utility feature. It allows you to automate your restricted state and even notify you if something goes wrong while, uh, while you're in that restricted state. So let's talk about manual volume logs. We hear about this, people writing down what tapes are used for a particular day. And so this is some of the automation that your product should uh, should do for you, whether it's Robot Save or BRMS. And uh, certainly the VTL makes that a lot simpler to accomplish. Uh, Offsite storage, were you even, did you even have at some point in 2020, 
the inability to get your tapes off site. There's a vulnerability. Right? So, you know, is that a, a potential uh, uh, fine that could occur if you don't get your tapes off site in 24 hours or less? Uh, potentially. All right. Certainly, the ability to get that data off site electronically is uh, certainly makes that a lot simpler. Uh, Eric talked a lot about the actual physical tape media and running out of tapes. Uh, certainly last year, we saw a lot of shipping concerns and that's bleeding over into this year. Will you have your tapes available uh, when you need them? And likewise, if they're not, are you taking tapes that maybe should be archived for a longer period of time and you're initializing them? All right, well, that's not good. Now you got yet another vulnerability. Likewise, we do talk to some folks that have some fairly uh, some some older software that maybe does backups from a menu. All right, so so you know how do you get around that? Some of those things, whether it's you know you created a, some kind of homegrown CL program, is there is there any kind of tape logging that's taking place there? Any kind of archiving of that data? Probably not. All right, so we think there's a better way. Another issue is the backup window. Your backup window has been reduced down to almost nothing. All right. You're given, you know, the business would like to see no downtime. You have to have some downtime. So there's some options. You could replicate your data off to a target system. Eric and I hear about this all the time where people are replicating off to a target system. They're running their backup there. They shut down the replication. They run their backup. And uh, uh, they use some kind of replication tool like Robot AJ, Minix, Itera, et cetera to get that data off to another, another partition someplace where they can actually run the backup. So there are a lot of options. Virtual tape library certainly is gonna uh, help with that. Uh, a tape management solution is really a critical piece of the puzzle, all right? Just, keep, just going hands off with your tapes is one, is one thing, but getting that automation in place uh, is, is another. And then there's the replication option where you can replicate to a second partition, run your backup there. And likewise, a lot of people are leveraging IBM flash copy as well, which is a point in time snapshot of the data. It requires IBM SAN technology. You mount up the flash on another partition and once again, run the point in time backup there, which is very cool. Okay, so how do you go about this automation process, especially for volume tracking and, and object uh, backup? Tracking. Well, in our case, and this would apply to BRMS as well, we, we talk a lot about Robot Save. So Robot Save offers the media management, tape vaulting, uh, the restoration and audit reports for when your backup runs, selective IFS saves. This could be really important if you're storing, for instance, PDF images uh, in the IFS. You should be getting those backed up as often as possible. Uh, we've heard of some folks having to restore IFS directories due to a ransomware attack. All right. And then providing that whole archive of what was saved, where it was saved to, when it was saved, and when, what was it saved correctly. All right. So that's what a, a tape management system will provide you. It catalogs all that information. It protects volume contents. It records all the information that was saved. There is one component that you need, though, from IBM, and that is media storage extensions, all right? Otherwise known as IBM's MSE, and it's product number 185770SS1, and it provides us the exit, program, exit points where we can put our programs that allow things like monitoring the volume usage out there on the VTL, controlling tape device activity, intercepting rogue initialized tape commands. So we don't want somebody just blindly out there uh, initializing tapes. We're gonna control that in the software. Uh, so all, all these additional functionality, uh, additional functions uh, around interfacing with the tape library, that's what MSE gives us. So the tape media, a solution should be able to manage your tape media. So we'll look at that real quick here and catalog what was saved, where it was saved, was it saved correctly and so forth. That's all part of the equation. So when you put your backup into your job flow, all right, 
you're going to be calling the program. You're not going to be running a, a, a um, uh, save object, save live. You're going to be calling the, the tape management systems command to make that happen. So let's take a look at what that looks like here in our environment. All right. And we're going to start with a job flow. This is, I, I use robot schedule, of course, uh, since I work for that particular company. And uh, I have a backup here that runs on a daily basis. All right. And uh, if we if we look at the properties of the backup, you'll see the commands that we're using there to execute the save. So the save is defined in our robot save product, and then the commands to run the save are embedded in that particular batch job. So uh, the command is right here, RBS save. So when you execute the RBS save command, that passes off control of robot save to do its thing. All right, we've actually got a two-part uh, backup process going on where we're doing an all, all user, and then we're doing a specific backup just for backing up the robot products. So when this, when this uh, backup goes to run, it's taking uh, about 45 minutes on this particular system. And the results of running the backup look like this. As I mentioned, the uh, um, robot creates audit reports and restoration reports that tell you exactly what happened. All right, so these are your audit reports. For instance, this is uh, RBS 405P, and this will tell you uh, what is on this particular backup and what volume was used for the backup. So let's look at that particular report. Oh, of course. I think I might be losing my connectivity. <laughs> Tell you what, let's uh, let's jump into a green screen real quick. All right, so I'm in Robot Save, and in Robot Save, uh, we can see the status of our um, backup. All right, so this is a daily backup that ran last night. And the report I was just going to show you is right here. So this is the result of running the save process and what libraries were saved. In this case, with an SL or Save Live command. And it says right here that ACAD15 was used as the, the volume last night. All right, so if we look here, ACAD15 here is in the uh, virtual tape library, and uh, we've got all the uh, usage and expiration information here in the, the VTL. And likewise, I can look at this information inside of Robot Save, inside of our media management view all right so here ac8015 says was used on the 13th and it's going to expire on the 25th and if i look at the volume information it says yeah it was used with your daily backup all right and what's on that particular volume all right so this is called the object archive and this gives you the restore ability so when i take the option to restore an object, that's when the magic takes place and we talk to the virtual tape library and we go to the particular sequence where that data is stored and we start the restore process. So let's actually do that, but I'm gonna make it just a little more complicated. Uh, we're gonna to go to the object archive and I'm gonna look at my library uh, and I'm going to go back a few days. I'm gonna go back to the eighth, cause you know what? I have a object that got corrupted on the ninth. So I wanna go back to the eighth and I wanna restore um, a specific object. Let's pick a file. So we're gonna just restore a particular object. And I'm gonna say restore it to the Chuck RST library. And I'm gonna submit that restore to batch. All right, so now the magic is happening, robot save, the tape management system is talking to the VTL. And if we look at the tracking, it says that we've got a restore running right now. All right, so if we go out here to the VTL, all right, we can see here in drive one, that tape volume from uh, last, what was it, the eighth, is now loaded up. In that in the tape drive in the VTL virtual tape drive, and uh, it's restoring that data. All right, so if we look at that library now, it might be restored already. 
Let's do a work live Chuck RST. And there it is. All right, so that object was just restored back to uh, my library. All right, so that's a, that's a really quick demo of uh, what the process looks like. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions now. And likewise, we're also going to launch a polling question. Ian, would you launch the poll? Yeah, there is the poll. And I will say that we're already a minute or so after. So Eric has been in the background answering a lot of these questions via text. If you had a question that you asked, you can put it in the Q&A panel. And Eric has answered quite a few of those already. So take a look at that. Um, why don't we take some of the ones that he hasn't indicated that he is answering via chat? Um, when replicating to an offsite remote VTL appliance, is the entire backup copied or does the VITL perform some sort of dedupe to reduce internet traffic? Okay, so yes, I can answer that. Um, the, the answer is gonna depend on which VTL appliance you're using. What ours does is we copy the entire backup across, we obviously compress it first. Um, and that's if you're using our replication that's built into our product. If you're using replication that's built into an existing dedupe appliance, like an exagrid, cohesity, rubric, etc., then theirs is going to be doing deduplication and then transforming just the um, deduped volume, the, the unique new chunks of information. Okay, and it looks like you answered the question about parallel saves. Yes, it does support parallel saves. That's in chat. Um, Chuck, how big was that file you restored to your Chuck RST library? Uh, I did not look at that. Uh, let's take a look real quick. So not real big. Fairly okay. small, but I went pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, does this all work think, with the, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think we might have time for one more question. Okay, um, why don't we answer the scaling question uh, that Eric started? Uh, it's just the question from Margaret. Uh, the degree of the VTL advantage until they have 300 plus terabyte partitions that require monthly backup retained for 10 years. How does a VTL not be cost prohibitive when we have regulations requiring a 10 year monthly save retention with multiple partitions that are 100 to 180 to 300 plus terabytes? So I guess it's a scaling question. Uh, yeah. Eric, you wanna answer that? Uh, I'll try. <laughs> 300 terabytes is a big partition, I'll say. Um, basically what I think you're gonna see is in cases like that, you're gonna want probably a dedicated deduplication appliance that can get you a good level of dedupe ratio, 10 to one, 20 to one. And that's gonna make it a little easier to handle that volume of data. I don't know, you know if they're backing up full saves every month or, or how they're doing that. Um, but yeah, once you start getting to sizes that are hundreds of terabytes, there are challenges involved with that. So to me, my thoughts are you basically just need a bigger system. You're going to need a lot of capacity. You're going to want to get a good dedupe ratio on that data because um, you're going to have to be storing a lot of data for a long time. OK, good. Sounds great. Uh, we are a bit over, so why don't we go ahead and end today. Uh, I'd like to thank Chuck. I'd like to thank Eric and everybody in the audience uh, for, partic for participating is the word I'm looking for. And people did ask about the replay and handout from today's presentation. Yes, those will be available on the common learning management system. It's got to render the video and upload the uh, handout. So it should be tomorrow morning. Everybody will get an email uh, when it's ready. Thank you for joining. Chuck and Eric, thank you for a good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. All right, everybody have a good day. Ending the meeting now.